This week, our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace has the pleasure of hosting Dr. Shahada Khalil Harb, known as Dr. Shauki Harb, from Ramallah by way of Farmington, Utah, talking about his wonderful uh, book, A Surgeon Under Israeli Occupation. Part personal uh, memoir, part narrative of the evolution of medical practice in Palestine, part description of the Palestinian Nakba. It's an important contribution to the documentation of the vibrancy of Palestinian culture and tradition amidst the Israeli uh, settler colonial apartheid and ethnic cleansing attempts to destroy their culture and the power of nonviolent resistance and their struggle, struggle for full political, civil, and human rights. Dr. Harb, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Fort Wayne. Thank you. It's my pleasure. There's so much I want to talk with you about, Shoki, but uh, uh, let's begin here. About an hour west of here in Indiana is Manchester University, a Church of the Brethren school that has the distinction of being the having the first peace studies program in the United States. Uh, I bring this up because for decades, it's also had a close relationship with the Friends School in Ramallah. And um, uh, my groups have been to the Friends School in Ramallah many times. We know Jean Zaru uh, very well from the Friends community there. Uh, and they have hosted students. Manchester University has hosted students uh, uh, enrolled there for many, many, many years. Talk about uh, how important the Friends School was in your early education um, and its continuing importance uh, for Ramallah and all of the Palestinian people. Well, the Friends Schools, which were initially established in 1869 by the both British and American Quakers, who came to Palestine and established first a day school uh, for uh, adult uh, male, and then uh, they opened a, a boarding school for girls. It, you can never overestimate the impact these schools had, not only on the cultural uh, life of the Palestinian, but also on the political, economic life of not only the Palestinians, but many people in the Middle East. I was lucky to have joined the, enrolled in the French schools in, in the 50s, in the early 50s, where I was able to enjoy the liberal way of thinking the free debate, which was not present in the schools I attended prior to that. They have an ongoing presence and an important presence and an important uh, uh, impact in Palestinian society even today. Absolutely, yes. They're very active and they're the graduates of the French schools you will find them everywhere in the Middle East and outside of the Middle East, most of the time manning very important positions, whether in the medical, engineering, or political sciences fields. Your medical education uh, took you to Germany, where you met your wife Heidi, then to the US, uh, before you returned for many decades a uh, long career uh, back home in Ramallah. You share stories in your book about many of your teachers, mentors, who had a profound impact upon uh, not only your education, but upon your, your life and your practice of medicine. The one name for lay people like myself, the one name that stands out uh, is Michael DeBakey, the Houston Medical Hospital, Houston Methodist Hospital. I know there's so much uh, uh, more you could say, but 
Are there a couple of experiences that stand out in your medical education that you could share? And then particularly with uh, Dr. DeBakey. Well, Dr. DeBakey was a very unusual uh, personality. First of all, he uh, had a fascinating experience as he uh, you know, volunteered in World War II as a doctor. And his trauma experience, his experience in treating injured uh, soldiers, uh, set the basis for his, I think, for his future uh, development as a heart surgeon. He also uh, visited uh, many centers in France, Germany, and Austria, which also shaped his uh, personality. And he was a very demanding uh, person. Uh, he wanted from us to be not only a perfection, perfectionist, he will never tolerate mistakes. And I'll tell you, I, I'm very proud and very honored to have this experience uh, uh, training under Michael DeBakey. Were you with him before or after he performed the heart transplant? Oh, I was with him after he performed the heart transplant. But not very long after. Not very long, no. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so he was performing heart transplants when you were there with him? Yes. He excelled in, in placing artificial hearts because the problem he faced, uh, and we all still face, so to find donor hearts. So he worked in the research lab through which I also rotated uh, to uh, manufacture uh, uh, artificial heart made out of you know, polyethylene, among other things. Yeah. Are, there, are there any other uh, experiences in your medical education that stand out for you with, with maybe other uh, surgeons or other physicians that you'd like to share? Well, in Houston, we had to rotate on the services of several giant heart surgeons including George Morris, who actually was also extremely disciplinary, but he was still waging the Civil War. His, I think, great-grandfather played a major role during the Civil War on the, side, on the side of the South, of course. But he was a very, very good surgeon. The other surgeon who I really enjoyed working with was Stanley Crawford who actually trusted me and asked me whether I could stay with him. But then I selected, uh, of course, to go back to the, my hometown in Ramallah. You know, I love, I love so many of the stories, I mean, with, with the personal touches. Uh, you had a bet with one of your mentors or something, and you won the bet, he lost. And I mean, there are a number of wonderful stories about your interaction through, through your medical education in your book, and that's one of the reasons why I hope people buy the book and read it, uh, for, in addition to all the many other reasons. Yeah, these are anecdotal, and you're right. They are a little bit funny and interesting. As long as we're talking about heart surgery, um, um, near the end of the book, you talk about how you introduced many new procedures uh, into the occupied Palestinian territories, including open heart surgery. Um, you've seen so many um, changes in the way medicine is practiced um, uh, after many decades at Ramallah Hospital. What's, what's the state of health care uh, and the practice of medicine in Palestine today? Well, it has improved a lot since the Palestinian Authority uh, took over. During the direct uh, control of the Israeli military authorities, the medical services did not progress a lot. And, of course, one reason 
uh, has been the fact that the Palestinians revolted and rebelled against the Israeli military occupation. There was the first intifada, then the second intifada, and in between there were always many intifadas, which, is, which means an uprising against the Israeli authorities. And as you might have noticed from my book, I had to deal lots with trauma, especially children. And, you know, treating um, traumatized children is a challenge of, of paramount uh, uh, and extreme proportion, which is not easy. I'm going to return to talking about uh, uh, your work uh, in the field of trauma in a minute, but I, I want to I want to ask you, uh, you practiced medicine in Germany, you, in France, uh, the United States, and Palestine. You say in your book, quote, the differences between the system of social medicine in Germany and private health care in the United States were significant for all involved, patients and doctors. Talk about those differences between the social uh, med practice of social medicine and private health care in the U.S. Yes. <clears throat> you know, in Germany and France, doctors are paid salaries. Very rarely, uh, the doctors are uh, paid uh, according to their, the amount of surgeries they do. So surgeons there don't necessarily rush to do surgeries. In contrast, in the United States, the more surgeries you do if you are in private practice, the more uh, income you'll have. And this actually set the tone, set the difference between how surgeons in the United States approach patients as compared to surgeons in France and Germany, which has both its advantages and, and disadvantages. For instance, very often surgeries in Germany or England also or France will be postponed unnecessarily so. While in the United States, very often, surgeries are done next day. <laughs> uh, so this is basically the major difference. Trauma. It's a rather long question, so just please bear with me. This is what you write about 1948. 1948 was the year when the settler colonial Zionist movement succeeded in uprooting the indigenous population of Palestine, the year Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, catastrophe in Arabic. <clears throat> and then a couple pages later, you continue. A collective post-traumatic stress disorder affected all Palestinians as a result of the Nakba, and it continues to haunt the people of the Middle East. Now, our friend in Bethlehem, Zugbi Zugbi, uh, always says there's no such thing for Palestinian people as post-traumatic syndrome. It's continuing traumatic uh, uh, syndrome because it, 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 it is always stress, always traumatic stress. So we've noticed that even though it's a patriarchal culture, but because of the stresses of the occupation that have been placed upon uh, families and individuals, increasingly there's a recognition of the need for counseling and therapy for families and individuals. Um, talk a little bit about the stresses and the trauma, but also the growing rec recognition among the Palestinian people of the need for interventions such as counseling and therapy and the rest. Right. Well, children were the most who were affected with this syndrome. And all over the Palestinian areas, it was noted that the outpatient clinics were overwhelmed with children with nightmares 
and, uh, uh, and signs of extreme fear, inability to go to school, uh, insomnia, unable to sleep. And uh, several studies came out about, about this phenomena, and it was without any doubt related to the effect of the Israeli occupation uh, and the impact of this occupation on particularly on children. Children were targeted because they were always in the street fighting, by the way, fighting Israeli tanks. As I <clears throat> have a picture in my book where a, a young Palestinian boy is throwing stones on an Israeli tank. And that same boy later on was, had to have to undergo bilateral amputation of his legs after he was shot by the Israeli soldiers using what so-called plastic bullets. So this is the post-traumatic distress syndrome that uh, Palestinian children experienced. And unfortunately, it, this trauma is, is played out in other ways, more negative ways in Palestinian society, and things that we don't like to talk about, but domestic uh, abuse, domestic violence, uh, um, uh, um, um, stealing, uh, uh, children stealing from local shops. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, manifestations of this trauma in families and in the society, other than just throwing stones at tanks and and other things. I mean, it's negative within the society. Yeah. Well, the behavior of the Israeli military occup uh, occupiers towards the Palestinian population forced everybody to stand up and fight. And very often, the children, be they, they, they were in the for uh, forefront of this struggle. I don't explain why the, this phenomenon, I cannot explain it right. But children has been always, Palestinian children has been all, have been always proactive. Uh, and I'm, when I talk about children, the ages between 14 and 18, so they are young adults. And many of the killed and wounded by Israeli gunfire were of this age group. We have, <clears throat> tell me if this is what your medical practice has borne out. We have some friends who we have visited and we continue to visit my groups in, in uh, Palestine, the occupied territories. Basim Tamimi in uh, Nabi Saleh and his family and Iyad Bernat in Berlin. Uh, and both of them are leaders of the resistance movements with Friday afternoon uh, um, uh, demonstrations. Both of them, uh, the children of the village, are in the forefront of the protests and demonstrations. And studies have been done in, by psychiatrists in the West suggesting that the kids who are actively involved in the protests and demonstrations, ironically, are, are more well-adjusted, are able to deal with the, the uh, cope with the stress and trauma, although they're traumatized, but are able to deal with it better than those who aren't part of protests and demonstrations, whose parents keep them in the background. And I, I think that that's an amazing kind of a fact that might be little known in the West. Well, uh, I'm not personally aware of the study, but I can very well imagine that this might be the case. Uh, you know, children usually adapt uh, faster than adults. It's the old proverb. It is very hard, very often, to teach a, an old dog. So I think this study might be very well true. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's very hard to tell the, the final impact on these children uh, till they are grown up. Yeah. Mm. The reason that uh, 
I asked you about uh, the growing recognition is because two of our close friends, um, uh, George and Najwa Saada, Christians from Bethlehem who were part of the bereaved parents group. Their one daughter, Christine, was shot by the Israeli military. The older daughter, Marianne, is now, an, uh, I think she'll be receiving her MD in the next year. But she has, uh, um, she's specializing in um, mental health uh, medicine. And so th that's, that's one. Our friend Zugby Zugby, he has a son who is just finishing his PhD at Michigan State here in the U.S. Uh, in trauma studies among Palestinian children and Palestinian prisoners. And so there, it's anecdotal, but my, my sense is that there is this growing recognition that there's a need among young people to deal with the trauma that they and their peers have been experiencing as they've grown up. That's uh, true. And as a matter of fact, my daughter-in-law, who has a degree in a PhD in psychology, and she teaches in Philadelphia. She's originally Austrian. And she made a study and published that study on Palestinian children suffering from the effects of Israeli measures against them. The fear, the nightmares, the sleeplessness, not attending schools, among others. In the back of your book, uh, you include a copy of the letter from the anti-Arab racist Israel uh, Knesset member, Meyer, uh, uh, Rabbi Meyer Kahani, which he sent to you in 1987, encouraging you, urging you to leave, uh, to leave Palestine. When I read this letter and your account uh, of receiving it, and now... Three and a half decades later, disciples of Kahane, people who revere him, are now members of the, uh, of the ruling government. What are your thoughts about, um, well, reflect back about receiving this letter and tell us the story. And now what are your thoughts uh, about what's happening inside Israel today? Right. Well, <clears throat> Mayur Kahane... He was then a member of the Israeli parliament. He sent me an official letter with his address to the Israeli Knesset. And it was, has the imprint of the Israeli Knesset. So it was a, a, an official letter asking me to leave the country. By the way, he sent the letter also to other personalities in Palestine. And he said, if you don't want to leave the country, you can stay as a slave for the Jewish people. And if you refuse these two options, and this is all in the letter, which is in my book, if you refuse these two options, then consider yourself to be at war with the Israeli people. So, uh, as you know, I refused uh, to leave, so <laughs> it seems I was at war with the Israeli people. <laughs> I don't think Kahane represents the Israeli people. I must admit, there were many Israelis who were against him and stood uh, vehemently against his ideas. Unfortunately, the present Israeli government is a representative of the ideas of Meir Kahane. It's not only Meir Kahane. Uh, an American pediatrician with the name of Baruch Goldstein, he takes his machine gun and enters the, a mosque in Hebron and shoots from the back, the, uh, 35 Palestinian worshippers and this guy he's adorned and honored by <coughs> uh, by many 
uh, fanatic Israelis. Unfortunately, the present government in Israel represent this type of ideology. And this is very dangerous because you, you probably know that Israel and this government has nuclear weapons capabilities. And this is scary. When we go to Hebron on all of our trips, <clears throat> we go to the Ibrahimi Mosque, put our fingers in the uh, holes that the bullets have made by the mihrab uh, and on the front wall. And uh, we we're, we're each time are aghast at how another human being can do this to other human beings uh, just in, in general, but as they're worshiping and praying, killed 29 and wounded scores and scores and scores of, of others. Um, I only have a few more questions. Um, you don't dwell on this in your book, but I, I want to ask you about a few important examples uh, that, that, uh, that of you and your family being harassed and threatened while serving in Ramallah? Well, one time, <clears throat> Israeli soldiers knocked on my door. And it was probably 1976. And I opened the door. My wife, Heidi, who was originally from Germany, was standing behind me. And they took me with them. My wife then screamed, is this somehow a Gestapo raid? They looked back <coughs> and grinned, but yet they took me and detained me. Uh, I was with others detained in the square near my house, about uh, you know, 500 yards uh, from my house. How old were you then? This was 1976, so from, yeah, I was 36, maybe. <laughs> your, the title of your book is A Surgeon Under Israeli Occupation. When the Israeli authorities were in control of the, I mean, in direct control of the hospital and of, the, uh, of Ramallah and the West Bank, you had trouble even getting the simplest of supplies. Correct. And in one so your case, practice of medicine was impacted. I mean, a surgeon under Israeli occupation, your, your medical practice was impacted. Absolutely. Um, you see, the Ramallah Hospital, where I practice, was the major hospital in the West Bank at that time. And it was under complete Israeli control. They were responsible for appointing personnel they were responsible for even supplying the heating oil and they were responsible for supplying the equipment. And this is, uh, you know, according to the Geneva, Article 4 of the Geneva Convention, this is the responsibility of the, uh, any occupying force. And we did not have any of these, neither equipment nor, occupy, nor heating oil uh, nor medications. And this led one of my colleagues, the head of the pediatric department at that time, to raise his voice, but he was then arrested and put in jail. I did not uh, stay still. I was lucky to have an interview with the ABC program 2020 in which I expressed my feelings about the behavior of the Israeli military authorities. Fortunately, they did not arrest me. And I think I was protected by the fact that I was interviewed by an American uh, company. You, yeah, you mentioned it in your book. Yes, yes, <laughs> I do mention that, yeah. Hmm. Nablus, Janine, Huara, Silwan, Sheikh Jarrah, 
Masafar Yata in the North Hebron Hills, and many more. Pockets of resistance, sometimes nonviolent, but sometimes armed resistance. Young people saying enough is enough of the daily humiliation and then even slaughter of their friends. More than one a day already in 2023. Palestinians being killed. Friends, neighbors, family members. Are we on the verge of a third intifada? I think it is, we are already in a third intifada. By the way, the first intifada never really ended. It has been a continuous resistance, most of the time peaceful, but also very often, very often violent resistance against the occupation. So the intifada is that when there is upsurge, then they call it a new intifada. But the resistance has been going on from the first day the Israelis occupied the West Bank. And I think this is in the nature of any occupying power. They will ultimately, uh, you know, ultimately have to face resistance from the local population. We have focused on the trauma, on the on uh, the threats, on the violence in this interview, but your book has a hopeful undertone. And um, um, you want to talk about the hope that I mean, I, you're you're a, a positive individual. You can tell just by visiting with you. But you, you, your your book also has this hopeful tone about it. In a way, yes, but I also draw the attention to the fact that Israel is a nuclear power, although you don't admit it, but it is a well-known secret. <laughs> and I believe it is a matter of time before an opposing power would acquire also nuclear weapons. So we will have at hand a rel religious fanatic uh, set up on one side with nuclear weapons capabilities, opposing another nuclear capabilities with possibly fanatic religious setup. This is a dangerous situation. This is not only of Middle Eastern or Israeli and Palestinian interest. It is of global interest if we are interested as human beings to prevent a biblical event on a, a nuclear confrontation or an Armageddon. So it is incumbent upon all of us to work for a peaceful settlement and for ending the occupation. Which leads me to the, to, I mean, you. I'm almost quoting back to you what you just said, but in your conclusion, this is what you write. A solution for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict caused by Zionism's settler colonialist venture is an international problem, and solving it is an international obligation. My dream of liberation for all the people of historical Palestine within one secular and democratic state is the only viable option if we want to avoid, God forbid, an event of biblical proportions. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to bring forward. So our obligation as American citizens is uh, uh, to work in this country uh, for, toward... Ending the occupation. Because the cause of trouble in Palestine is the military occupation of uh, the Palestinians. Of course, they claim that they ended the occupation in Gaza, but what they did was worse. They put Gaza under a hermetic siege. Nobody can get out or come in 
without going through the rigorous Israeli uh, formalities. And very often, you cannot get a permit. Dr. Shoki Harb, uh, we're delighted to be hosting you these few days here in Fort Wayne.